We're standing here today by the statue of the great Norse explorer, Leif Erikson, who found the Americas and settled colonies. Now, much like the great Viking Leif Erikson, there's another great Viking hero to discuss, and that is Harold Sigurdsson, otherwise known as Harold Hardrada. We're impoverished for heroes. The sort of men we look up to, those who are warriors and explorers, and conquerors are often not the same men who are in leadership above us. It's important to remember heroes because they show us in an age of modernity the true potential of a human life. The life and adventures of Harold Sigurdsson spanned almost the whole of the ancient world. Written in the Heimskringla, it's a story that makes the likes of modern fantasy seem modest. Born in the year 1015 to the lesser king Sigurd Havdinson and his queen Ostegud Brandsdotter, Harold, like many boys of his time, grew up quickly, being the half-brother of the now famous King Olaf. Harold would train to fight alongside his half-brother. At only 15 winters, Harold would join with Olaf at the Battle of Stiklestid to help his brother claim the Norwegian throne. But during the battle, Olaf was killed, later being designated as a saint and martyr. And the young Prince Harold was wounded on the field as it was clear the battle was lost, a warrior assigned to protect Harold, named Ragnvald Brusesson, would find him in the fray and drag him to safety. Harold would write the following verse, My wounds were bleeding as I rode, and down below the bonds strode, killing the wounded with the sword, the followers of their rightful lord. From wood to wood I crept along, unnoticed by the bond throng. Who knows, I thought, a day may come. My name will yet be great at home. The following year, as the ice thawed, Harold and a company of survivors from the battle left in exile, embarking on the long and dangerous journey to the lands of Kievan Rus. The Rus, later to evolve into the Russians, were a new faction in this time, founded just over a century before, when Swedish Vikings began to rule as nobles over the Slavic inhabitants of Eastern European lands. Despite their geographic separation, the Viking aristocracy of the Rus kept close ties with their kin in the north, remembering their fathers and their ancient rituals and ways. Once Harold and his company arrived in Kievan Rus, they were welcomed warmly by their kinsman, King Yaroslav, who was known in the Slavic tongue as Yaroslav the Wise. Yaroslav showed them hospitality, and for a time, Harold Sigurdsson, with the help of his men, served as a chief of defense in the king's army. Over the next two years, they ranged far and wide in those eastern lands, guarding them from all threats, and were well decorated for their service. It was during this time that Harold met King Yaroslav's daughter, Elisaveta Yaroslavna, who was said to be of surpassing beauty. Harold sought her hand in marriage, but King Yaroslav would not give away his daughter so easily. He challenged the young man with a test. In order to win his daughter's hand in marriage, Harold would have to prove himself through acquiring wealth and status. Harold took this challenge in stride and chose to journey south with his men. They left those lands and traveled through the Black Sea to the Great City. In the Old Norse, it was known 
as Miklagard. To us, it is known as Constantinople. In the year 1034, Harold and his Viking band reached the walls of Constantinople. They were hired on quickly by Emperor Michael IV and his Empress Zoe as members of the Varangian Guard, which were the elite fighting force of the Byzantines. Comprised exclusively of Norse warriors who sought wealth and adventure in the much richer world of the Mediterranean. Truly living out a Viking's fantasy, they were free to raid the Arabic pirate enemies of the Eastern Roman Empire under the Byzantine flag with impunity, plundering the ships and lands of the region and accumulating wealth week by week. Over time, they amassed considerable riches and sent them north for safekeeping under the protection of King Yaroslav. But beyond their newfound wealth, it was the glory and the tales of his accomplishments which spread through the heart of the great city. And Harold was promoted to leader over the entire Varangian Guard, the most well-paid and lethal fighting force of their day. As leader of the Varangians, he sacked dozens of Arab fortresses on campaigns in the Holy Land and used his wits and bravado to capture yet more strategic fortresses and territory in lands such as Italy, Bulgaria, and Sicily. As Harold was busy on campaign, however, Emperor Michael IV died in 1041, and a new emperor, Michael V, took the throne and deposed Empress Zoe. Unlike his predecessor, Michael V was quick to see enemies around every corner, and soon saw the rising power and popularity of Harold Sigurdsson as a threat to his rule. At the earliest opportunity, Harold was swiftly thrown into the dungeons of the city on false charges and left there for months. But Harold wasn't destined to waste away in a dungeon, for it so happened that Emperor Michael V, through his lust for power and his paranoia, created too many enemies. He became so hated that a fierce riot broke out. In the chaos, Harold was able to escape from his confinement, at which point he regrouped with his companions and rallied the majority of the Varangian guard with him. With a momentous tide of rioters, the Varangians, led by Harold, demolished the palace defenses and entered the interchambers. Harold is said to have personally grabbed Emperor Michael V, castrating him and blinding him and leaving him to his fate with the enraged citizenry. The saga say of this moment, quote, He who the hungry wolf's wild yell quiets with prey the stern the fell. Midst the uproar of shrieks and shout, stung the Greek emperor's eyes both out. The Norse king's mark will not adorn. The Norse king's mark gives cause to mourn. His mark the eastern king must bear, groping his sightless way in fair. After seizing this moment of freedom and revenge, and dethroning the most powerful emperor of the medieval world, the Empress Zoe returned to claim her title. She forbade Harold and his men from leaving the city, but under cover of night, they slipped into their longships and cleverly maneuvered their ships over the city's great defensive sea chain. He and his Viking crew returned north to Kievan Rus, more wealthy and famous than could have been expected. Yaroslav the Wise was greatly impressed with Harold's newfound great wealth and accomplishments, and a large wedding was at last held between the young Norwegian Prince Harold and the Swedish-descended Russian Princess Elisaveta. Ever ambitious, Harold's eyes turned towards the north, where he knew his final challenge lay. While in Kievan Rus, he rallied together a great army 
and mobilized them towards the aim of securing his claim to the Norwegian throne. They took the long journey northwest to Sweden. He arrived in boats filled with gold on the eastern coast of Sweden and allied with the Swedish king who helped gather yet more men to assist him in taking the throne from King Magnus of Norway. It is said of his arrival, quote, The fairest cargo ship e'er bore from Russia's distant eastern shore. The gallant herald homeward brings gold and a fame that scald still sings. The ship through dashing foam he steers, through the sea rain to Svitjord veers. And at Sigtuna's grassy shores, his gallant vessel safely moors. This great combined Viking army raided King Magnus's lands throughout his territory in Denmark and Norway, until eventually King Magnus was forced to meet in negotiation with Harald. Harald Sigurdsson agreed to cease hostilities in exchange for an equal share of the title of king and a combining of their treasuries, thus giving Harald the title of king and giving Magnus peace and greater wealth. After a number of years of joint kingship, Magnus died, and Harald assumed title and power as the sole king of Norway in the very homeland where he had been exiled from over a decade before. With this ascension, his heroic arc from defeated boy to triumphant king was complete. King Harald ruled for many years, helping his kingdom to prosper and keeping the shores of Norway safe. He is also known to have finished a great church that King Magnus had started, which was dedicated in honor to St. Olaf. King Harald was not a perfect man, and over time, his pride grew such that the people of Norway feared to question him and gave him the name Hardrada, meaning hard ruler. But he was also generous, helping save the lives of his fellow Scandinavians in Iceland during its time of famine. But the thrones of Scandinavia and the North Sea were never long without chaos and conquest. Like a true Viking, Years later, Harold would die honorably in the Battle of Stamford Bridge in the year 1066 in England. And his legacy would go on to inspire the virtues of strength, adventurism, and determination in Scandinavia for countless generations. The Scandinavians, for thousands of years, much like their Germanic cousins, valued honor and legacy above temporary possessions. At a time when the Scandinavian and German tribes were closely tied together, the Roman historian Tacitus writes of their intense notion of honor, saying in chapter 14 of his work Germania, quote, When they go into battle, it is a disgrace for the chief to be surpassed in valor, a disgrace for his followers not to equal the valor of the chief, and it is an infamy and a reproach for life to have survived the chief and returned from the field, to defend and protect him, to ascribe one's own brave deeds to his renown, is the height of loyalty. The chief fights for victory, his vassals fight for their chief. If their native state sinks into the sloth of prolonged peace and repose, many of its noble youths voluntarily seek those tribes which are waging some war both because inaction is odious to their race and because they win renown more readily in the midst of peril and cannot maintain a numerous following except by war. As is written in the 76th verse of the Habermal, cattle die and kinsmen die, and so one dies oneself. But a noble name will never die if good renown one gets. Thank you for listening to the first Nord Hooger documentary. I'm excited to produce much more covering the wide breadth of European history and mythology. Consider joining me on this journey by following this channel, 
and letting me know what you think and what you would like to see in the future in the comments below. Thank you.